<coughs> okay, everyone. So, let us continue where we left off uh, yesterday. Uh, yesterday we had a look at the uh, uh, Upakalesa Sutta, uh, and now we're going to uh, look really at the kind of final parts of the Buddhist path, the very end, the awakening experiences, and a few other things as well. Uh, uh, we're going to have a look at today. I'm going to start with a sutta called uh, uh, Gaya at Gaya's Head. This is on page 39 in your little booklet, if you want to see it in your booklet. Uh, I'm going to not follow the order in the booklet. I'm going to uh, have a teacher's prerogative and do, <laughs> do things slightly differently. Uh, so we're going to start with this one here. And this follows nicely on from the previous sutta because it is about the vision of light and forms and it talks a little bit more about the idea of light and forms which is kind of interesting. And it also talks about devas. Are you interested in devas? <laughs> okay, good. This is a little bit more about devas. That's really, I'm glad you're interested otherwise I'll be in trouble. So, uh, <laughs> so let's see what this sutta has to say. Uh, at one time the Buddha was staying near Gaya, at Gaya Head. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, before my awakening, when I was still not awake, but intent on awakening. So we're still dealing with the um, Buddha-to-be, before his awakening, all the things that he has to do. Uh, I perceived light, but, not, but did not see visions. Yeah, this is now becoming a familiar theme from the previous sutta. So here the mind is bright, he sees some sort of light, but there's no form, there's no visions. Now visions can be many different things, and sometimes the visions can be a row of houses, <laughs> which is nice, yeah? But uh, the, the, one of the things to remember about the mind, the mind is very creative. Uh, and uh, when you start to become peaceful in meditation, uh, uh, the mind starts to become powerful, and a powerful mind is able to create almost any kind of vision that you want. Uh, and this is why you can see uh, rows of houses, you can see almost anything. Uh, yeah. And sometimes those visions are going to be just creations of the mind, uh, and when they are creations of the mind, they're not all that interesting, yeah, because it's just the, crea <laughs> the creative activity. Uh, but at other times, they actually re are real things. There may be glimpses into past life experiences, uh, or, as we shall see in this sutta, it may actually be a vision of other realms. Uh, yeah, the realms of the devas, or maybe the realms of the ghosts. Uh, in this case, we're going to have a look at the realms of the devas. Uh, so when you see a form, yeah, a form can be very simple. Uh, it can be like what we call the samadhi nimitta, the light in the mind which kind of brings you to samadhi. But it can also be other forms. Uh, so the word rupa here, form, is a very broad idea. Uh, and in fact, if you are to see a deva in your meditation, it's a very similar experience to the idea of a nimitta. You see a the bright sun and a deva can be a very similar experience to that uh, as you start out with having these kind of visions. Uh, they're not that different. Uh, they are forms and they are lights, uh, and you would expect that to be the case. Why would you expect that to be the case? Well, because uh, when you have these experiences in meditation of seeing lights, uh, this is the kind of mental state uh, that will lead to that kind of rebirth, right? Uh, because you're getting close to the jhanas, you're getting close to the very bright states of mind, uh, and these are similar states uh, to the rebirth into the high deva loka. So you expect a certain parallelism between what you experience in your meditation and what the reality is behind that. Uh, so uh, he perceives light, uh, but does not see visions. He calls it visions here. Last time it was forms, here it's visions, but uh, it's basically the same idea. A form can either be a vision, or it can be something you feel, right, with the body. Yeah. Then it occurred to me, what if I were to perceive light and see visions? Then my knowledge and vision would become even more purified. This is Jnana Dasana again, the idea of knowledge and vision. And of course, if you're going to be the Buddha, you want to have full knowledge and vision of anything that really matters in the, uh, in the world. Yeah? especially in the world when it comes to happiness and suffering, what is achievable in terms of rebirth, what is achievable in terms of meditation attainments. This is very significant and you need to understand that. If you don't understand that, you don't really understand happiness and suffering. 
So this is part of having that purification of understanding happiness and suffering here. Jnana dasana, closely related also to the idea of view. View is ditti, dasana. Both ditti and dasana are the same, basically the same word. Uh, uh, means seeing. Uh. So you want to see things more clearly, more deeply, have more right view, if you like. Uh. My knowledge and vision will become even more purified. And you, so he, he's here on the quest to seek the full knowledge and vision here. Uh. So after some time, living alone, withdrawn, heedful, keen, and diligent, I perceived light and saw visions. Yeah, so he just inclines his mind towards seeing visions, and because he inclines his mind towards that, then eventually he, he will see those things, because he is basically just inclining his mind. There's a, there's a kind of a... a like almost like a desire there to see those things and the inclination comes with it uh, so here he's kind of uh, going step by step uh, yeah getting a deeper and deeper understanding of what is happening here and that but then he says but i didn't associate with those de deities uh, converse or engage in discussion uh. So here, the de those deities here, obviously, are, are related to the rupa, the form, that we, or the visions that we saw before. Uh, so here, the visions uh, correspond to deities. Uh, before, it corresponded just to a light in the mind. Uh, when we're doing the uh, uh, Upakilesa Sutta here, to deities. So that it's almost, it can be one or the other, depending on the situation. Of course, you will recognize the difference in your meditation practice, uh, but they are similar in quality here. Uh. Oops. Okay, go away. Uh, <coughs> so, yeah, the Buddha to be takes it one step further. He wants to really understand what is going on with these deities. Uh, then it occurred to me: What if I were to perceive light and see visions and associate with those deities, uh, converse and engage in discussion with them? Uh, then my knowledge and vision would become even more purified. Uh, so after some time, I perceived a light and saw visions, uh, and I associated with those deities, uh, conversed and engaged in discussion with them. Uh, yeah, so again, he's just inclining his mind in that way, uh, and then as he does that, uh, he starts to kind of uh, engage in, with his deities. Yeah, so here now he's kind of he's associating with them. he's hanging out with the deities. <laughs> yeah, having discussion. <laughs> Having discussions with them, how how are you? What's you know what's what's going on up here in this deva loka? And uh, you know, are you? Is it nice to be a deva or is it suffering to be a deva? These are the, these are the kind of discussions that he would be interested in, right? Because this is what he's looking for. He's looking for understanding the world, uh, happiness, suffering, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so this is kind of uh, cool, right? This is really I don't know. There's something uh, really <laughs> interesting about this. Uh, so. Uh, is the Buddha to be happy with this? Of course not. But I didn't know which order of gods those deities came from. In other words, what group of gods, right? Just like human beings is one group, gods and many different kinds of gods. Then it occurred to me, what if I were to perceive light and see visions and associate with those deities, converse and engage in discussion with them? and find out which order of gods those deities come from. Uh, then my knowledge and vision will become even more purified. Uh. After some time I perceived light and saw visions, uh, and I associated with those deities, uh, and I found out which order of gods uh, those deities uh, came from. Uh. Yeah, so you can see here the Buddha is starting to make a map of what is possible in the world, uh, a map of the various kinds of deities, uh, understanding the various kind of realms. That's why he wants to know the order of deities. Uh, and this is why later on in Buddhism we have this idea of various kinds of gods. We have the Tavatingsa gods, uh, we have the Chattu Maharajika devas, uh, we have the Tusita devas, the Yama devas, the Nimanarati devas, the um, uh, uh, Padanimitavasavati devas, and then you have the Brahma de devas, and I even gods beyond that. So the kind of is, it's like he's mapping out the world, what is possible. Uh, and once you have mapped out the world, well then you have a full understanding of what is possible in terms of happiness and suffering, where it is possible to be reborn, what it means to be reborn in those cases. And only when you have a full understanding of this uh, 
can you make a final decision about happiness and suffering? Uh, and then the nisarana, the release from those things, going beyond those things. Uh, so this is kind of part of the knowledge and vision of the Buddha. You have to really have a full idea of Buddhist cosmology to be able to uh, find that final awakening, understand what is going on here. Um, he would be in meditation at this point because you need a very peaceful mind there. But it wouldn't be very deep meditation, right? Uh, it wouldn't be super deep because then he wouldn't be able to do this. Uh. There is, uh, yeah. But you would have to have some basis in meditation because the mind would have to be very peaceful to be able to access these things. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's please, please, let's hold the hold the uh, questions till we. I'm going to open up for questions soon. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but I didn't know what deeds caused those deities to be reborn there after passing away from here. So after some time I found out what deeds caused those deities to be reborn there after passing away from here. Yeah? So the same thing again, understanding the universe, the karma that leads to these things, uh, uh, all of this has to do with understanding the, uh, the evolution of the mind, how the mind develops from one realm to another one, etc. But I didn't know what the deeds caused those deities to have such food and such experience of pleasure and pain. The connection between action and pleasure and pain. That's an important point about kamma. Kamma is the connection between your intentions, yeah, your willed intentions, and your experience in terms of pleasure and pain in the future. This is the idea of kamma. Sometimes people think that kamma is much broader. Sometimes people think, oh, you know, I... I became, you know, uh, I got married to this person, that, that's my kamma. But actually, whether you get married to this person, that person doesn't have anything to do with kamma. Because marriage itself does not mean pleasure or pain. <laughs> well, some people say it means, means pleasure or pain, but uh, it, 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 <laughs> it, it, it doesn't mean that a specific pleasure or pain. Yeah, there's just different people, you can't really say. Yeah. So it is not whether you become a, you know, a, a policeman or a politician or an engineer. You know, that has nothing to do with pleasure or pain. It's just different occupation. So these are just habits of the mind. Habits of the mind is not the same as kamma. Kamma is the direct, direct link between your intentions, your actions in one life, uh, and then the result of pleasure and pain in the future. That's what kamma is about. Uh, There's an important difference there. So many of the things we experience are just habits. Uh, some of the things we experience are also uh, kama vipaka, the result of kama. So after some time, I found out what deeds caused those deities to have such food uh, and such an experience of pleasure and pain. Uh. But I didn't know that those deities have a lifespan of such a length. Uh. So after some time, I found out that those deities have a lifespan of such a length. Uh. Yeah, this is important because uh, uh, you want to know whether it is permanent or impermanent, uh, these uh, states. Uh, if they are permanent, like some theistic religion might say you get reborn in heaven is permanent, but uh, Buddha-to-be is here saying that everything is actually impermanent. Everything has a lifespan. Uh, sometimes the lifespan may, may be extraordinarily long, but it still comes to an end. Uh, and when it comes to an end, uh, well, you're back to square one again. Uh, it's like snakes and ladders. You climb, climb, and bang, go back to the bottom. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe that's where they got this idea for that game, Snakes and Ladders. Yeah, they, uh, Sangsara, kind of going, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> was Nearly there, exactly. But <laughs> yeah, but there's always this gap at the end that you always fall down the same place. <laughs> but I didn't know whether or not I, ha I had previously lived together with those deities. Then it occurred to me, what if I were to perceive light and see visions and associate with those deities, converse and engage in discussion with them, uh, find out which order of gods those deities came from, uh, and what deeds caused those deities to be reborn there after passing away from here. Here means as a human being, right? And what deeds caused those deities to have such food and such experience of pleasure and pain, uh, and that those deities have a lifespan of such length, uh, 
and whether or not I have previously lived together with those deities. Uh, and that's another interesting point. Have I previously been there? In other words, uh, you know, this has to do with the ups and downs of samsara. Maybe you have a nice rebirth, but then suddenly it's over. You're back, you know, back here again afterwards. Uh, that's another kind of um, part of this whole idea of understanding the cyclical nature of uh, existence. Uh, then my knowledge and vision will become even more purified. Uh, so after some time, uh, you know all of these things, and I found out whether or not uh, I have previously lived together with those deities. Uh, So this is uh, this whole, uh, all of these things that the Buddha to be has to do to really understand what the world is like. Yeah, if you're going to understand existence, if you're going to understand samsara, you're going to understand what is possible. You're going to understand whether it is satisfactory or not. You need to have a very broad vision of reality. Yeah? What are the possible rebirths? Where can the mind go in the future? Where can it not go? Of course, on top of this, you also have the very long-lived deities like the Brahma Loka, and you also have the lower realms. You also have to understand the lower realms as well, because that's part of the equation. It's a very important part of the equation, because it makes samsara so much more problematic, yeah, if you have lower realms. It makes it much more problematic and difficult, and you really want to avoid that. So what should our relationship be to all of these deities? Are they realistic? Should we believe in deities? Is there anyone here who thinks devas is nonsense? Uh, please don't be afraid of saying yes, because uh, you know I, it's good that you just be honest about it. Yeah, there are many people in the world who think these kind of things are just superstition. Uh, but I think it's true. I think it is those who don't believe it who are superstitious, uh, because that is the wrong view. Uh, yeah, if you have wrong view, you are superstitious. Uh, so they are the ones who are superstitious, in my opinion. Uh, but this is the real deal. Uh, so why, how can this be the real deal? And I, what I like to do is to compare these kind of deities we're talking about in Buddhism to the deities that theistic religions have. In a theistic religion, you have a deity that is always there, that is permanent, is the creator of the universe. It is a deity which is outside of time and space. And if it's not outside of time and space, it is permanent, always existing here. But these kind of deities we're talking about here, they are a bit like us, right? They're not that different from us. Okay, they have a bit more power, they have a bit more pleasure, but they get born, they die. Sometimes they fight in the heavenly realms that you find the suttas where the deities are fighting with each other. This is just the lower deities. The high deities don't fight, but the lower ones, they're more like us. But if you start to look at them, they look suspiciously like us. Yeah, They have the same problems that we have, the same problems of suffering, of dying, of impermanence, being reborn, going up and down in samsara. So there is an enormous difference between the idea of the gods of a theistic religion, which is a creator god, that's a completely different category. That's a god that stands outside of nature, has nothing to do with nature. And that's why it is called a miracle when a god like that does things, because it is supernatural in the real sense of the term. These gods here are not supernatural. They are part of the fabric of samsara. They are almost exactly like we are. Yeah, They have the same kind of problems as we have. So these are, you might call them supernormal. They're beyond our normal perception of things, uh, but they're not supernatural. Uh, and uh, what is, I think, very important about this is that because uh, these gods are very much like us, uh, because they are impermanent, uh, because we can see them, uh, because we can converse with them in this way, uh, they are things that we actually can experience. These kind of gods can be experienced, uh, yeah, because they have the characteristics uh, of things that can be experienced. Uh, but a creator god, uh, a god that is always there, that is beyond time and space, uh, can, be, can by definition never be experienced. Uh, you can never know anything which is beyond time and space. Uh, you can never know something that actually is eternal, because everything we know exists in time. It cannot be eternal. If something is eternal, well, maybe it is, but you wouldn't be able to know it. Uh, because we only have experiences, and experiences are always limited. Uh. So if someone says that they have seen God, uh, it is impossible to see the kind of creator God. Uh, because you will never be able to know that that God is eternal, because all our experiences are limited in time. Uh. 
And that is kind of very fascinating, because what that means is that uh, the gods that we are dealing with here, they are actually realistic kind of gods. Uh, these are experienceable kind of gods. Uh, whereas the eternal God, the creator God of the universe, by definition, is beyond experience. Uh, and because of that, they are a figment of the imagination. They are human-made. They cannot actually be known by human beings. Uh, and that's kind of extraordinary when you start thinking about it. Uh, because what that means, it kind of shifts your idea of the world. Because normally, what we are used to thinking is that these gods here are more primitive. Uh, yeah? And then the world develops, our philosophy develops, our sophistication develops over time. And then we merge all of these gods together and we kind of create one god. Uh, this is kind of the history uh, that is often told about the evolution of the idea of god. Uh, and then you get one God, and that's the creator God, and that's kind of the high, the pinnacle of gods. Uh. But I think it's the other way around. Uh. I think the pinnacle idea of gods is actually this idea. Uh. This is the correct idea. And when you start merging these gods together, and you create a, you, we make a creator God, uh, at that point we have gone beyond evidence, uh, and we have created something which doesn't exist anymore, because it is impossible to know that such a God can exist. Uh. So these gods, uh, to me, are the real deal. The creator god, that is the problem. And uh, what is kind of fascinating about this, of course, is that um, um, the, uh, you know, if you look at the history of uh, humanity, you look at all the various kind of uh, cultures around the world, whether it is uh, you know, in China or U European culture or whatever it is, uh, all these cultures, they had their gods. Uh, yeah? they go, you have the ancient Roman gods, the Greek gods, the Nordic gods, the Indian gods, the gods in China. Every culture has their gods. You go to Africa, they had their gods. Uh, and that seems to be a universal experience of humanity, to have these kind of gods. Uh, and uh, I think, quite possibly, the reason for that is because it's not just that we need those gods and we kind of pray to them because we need them, uh, but I think another quite possible explanation is that we are all seeing something deeper. Uh, we are tapping into an underlying reality that is there for every one of us. Uh, and that is why this is a universal experience across human culture and across human societies. Uh, don't know, but that seems to me a quite plausible explanation. Uh, instead of dismissing it as many kind of modern anthropologists would do and saying it is just something that we make because we need a God to help us. Yeah, God, please help. And then it's my little God against your little God and this kind of stuff, which is uh, crazy. And, and uh, so this is how these things come about. Uh. Okay, so let's um, finish off this little sutta. As long as my knowledge and vision about the deities was not fully purified from these eight perspectives, uh, I didn't announce my supreme perfect awakening in this world uh, with its gods, Maras, Brahmas, uh, this population with its ascetics and Brahmins, its gods and humans. Uh, yeah, you need to have the full knowledge into these things before you can call yourself awakened. But when my knowledge and vision about the deities was fully purified from these eight perspectives, uh, I announced my supreme perfect awakening in this world with its gods, Maras, uh, and Brahmas, this population with its ascetics and Brahmins, its gods uh, and humans. Uh, Knowledge and vision arose in me here. My freedom is unshakable. This is my last rebirth. Now there will be no more future lives. And this is, you can see how this is becoming a, a um, like something that almost all of these suttas, they end in this way. You have a certain knowledge and vision, and then it ends with having this insight. Yeah, so we can, uh, we have to assume here that uh, the Buddha would have uh, had insight to these things at different times, and then eventually when all of these things came together, then he became an arahant and he gave all of these things up. Uh. So there you are. I don't know what you think about that sutta, but I thought it was cool to kind of uh, add it in there. So, uh, <laughs> Okay, so let's do a little bit more meditation together.
<coughs> okay, so um, any comments or questions about this? Huh? Ajahn, good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, the one that mentioned eight perspectives. What is the eight? Uh, what is? The, the, it's just the eight, the eight that things that we're talking yeah. about, right? Talking about uh, finding out whether I lived or not previously as one perspective. Uh, uh, whether the experience pleasure, pain, and food as another perspective. The deeds that cause that. Uh, yeah, so each, each one of these things that we went through is the eight perspectives. Uh, the length of life. But I think there's only seven. Yeah. There's only seven? Huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I, you, have, you have counted them. Okay, that's, wow, that's very, very impressive. Okay, I, yeah. Anyway, that, I, think that's the, I think that's the idea, is those, those seven or eight or whatever. Maybe one has gone missing. <laughs> I'm not sure, maybe Mara can go in there and took it out. And <laughs> Thanks, Anjan. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think yeah, it's coming. I think so. yeah. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Yeah. I have two questions. Yeah, all right. Um, in one of the paragraph, it says that uh, the Buddha to be, he perceived light and saw visions, but he didn't associate with those deities, converse, or engage in discussion. Yeah. When he did converse with those deities, what language did he use? <laughs> <laughs> Second question is. Yeah. Yeah. When you mentioned that he converses with deities, gods, that means uh, higher than the human realm, did he also converse with those in the ghostly realm or the, in the hell, hell beings? Hell realms, okay. Yeah. All right. So that he has a full spectrum of the 31 realms of existence. Yeah, I think the, uh, I think the conversation is, a, is more like a men mental conversation. Yeah. That's what they say, you converse directly with mind. And so, because you're conversing with mind, it's like there was a universal language there, which goes across across ordinary languages. Uh, so I think the human languages are just uh, an expressions of a deeper thing, which is kind of primordial thought. So which are the things that actually give rise to human languages? Uh, I think this is a fairly. Um, I think this is kind of uh, established, uh, or, or at least partially established, by uh, people who have this experience that that's actually how you have conversations with these deities. Uh, as far as um, the other realms are concerned, I don't know. If, is it possible? It may be possible to have a conversations with those them as well. But there may be some beings you can't really have conversations with. I wonder, like animals, can you have conversations with an animal uh, on the mental realm? I'm not sure if it is possible. There may be certain limits to where and who you can have conversations with. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where those limits are drawn. Sometimes you may just be able to observe rather than actually have conversations and through observations, draw inferences about uh, lifespan and those kind of things. So, so I can't really say that there's, there's nowhere in the suttas where the Buddha is said to have conversations with uh, beings in hell. So uh, not sure. But also one of yeah okay, all right okay. Thank you, <laughs> Ajahn. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Um, in connection with this question, the converse. Yeah. There's a word there, santitati. It's the same one as citta. Kitam Paganati, Pasidati, uh -huh. Santitati, Vimochati, right? Okay. That means it's like um, stay there, right? Uh, so he, this, so this is oh, this is the one here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So yeah. So this is, I think, associate with uh, Sadding, Tai Deva Sadding, Santitami. I stayed with them. Yeah. So yeah. it's like stay with the mind, stay in the jhana, something like that. The other one. Right. Yeah, so it's a similar w word that they use for the samadhi states, for san santitati, vimuchati, uh, uh, yes. etc., etc. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a similar kind of word. So it uh, certainly allows for certainly allows for that kind of uh, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Morning, Anjan. Good morning. Yeah. I hope you are more perky and lively this morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question on one of the aspects. 
uh, regarding food. Food, okay. Food is always interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it does strike me that um, kind of unusual of all the questions yeah. for food to be one of the aspects, uh, which is what deeds yeah. that cause the deities to have that kind of food. Yeah. Okay, so the Pali word is ahara. And ahara means, means like sustenance. Yeah? So it's not just food, it's actually sustenance. And ahara can, in the suttas, for example, there's the four aharas, which are the sustenance of hu human beings. Uh, only one of them is uh, food, uh, ordinary food. Uh, the other one is contact, uh, the fact that we contact the world. Uh, another one is volition, uh, will, and the last one is consciousness. Uh, and so these are food in the broader sense, in the sense that the, they are the things that uh, uh, allow us to exist. Uh, yeah? They are such that sustain our existence. Uh, so what is it that sustains you in that realm? That's really the question here. Uh, yeah? What keeps you going? How, how is it that you don't die straight away? What sustains you in that realm? So you understand the food in, the bro in, in inverted commas yeah? that actually drives you, keeps you going. And as human beings, we also need more than physical food. The will is one of the foods of human beings because the will is what makes life meaningful to us. Uh, yeah, because we do, we love, we, we want to, we love to do things. Uh, yeah, and that doing is a very important part of what we are as human beings. Uh, we also like to experience, and experience happens through uh, consciousness or contact, uh, and so that is also becomes a food in the sense that it sustains us as human beings. So this is the question he has: here. What sustains them? Uh, what keeps them going in that realm? Uh, understanding this is so it's a much broader thing than that. Uh, yeah. So that's a good point, actually. So maybe, maybe the good uh, Maybe that's not such the ideal translation, perhaps. Not sure. But thank you. That, that's a good point. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I remember in. I can't remember what's the sutta's name, where where um, Buddha enlightened, and then uh, he went on to have um, three knowledges, mm. and one of the, one of them is actually uh, in my past life what food I yeah, have, yeah. what food. So it strikes me as very strange. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same the same word in that that sequence. Also ahara, which is more like sustenance than than, than uh, in a broad sense. Yeah, yeah. Please. Uh, yeah. 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 Is this sutta part of the second watch and the third watch of the night? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this whole... Uh, um, uh, I, I, I think this is probably more than that, yeah? Because we have seen now the kind of the, the Buddha to be his kind of development of his mind from many different aspects. Uh, the abandoning of the hindrances and all these kind of insights into uh, the reality. I think I think this, this this cramming too much into those little watches of the night, yeah, they kind of like, it's going to be very very sort of. Uh, um, I, I suspect that the Buddha's awakening process happened over a long period of time, uh, and then it culminated in those three deep insights at the very last night when the mind was ready uh, and he had actually developed all of these things. So I would, I, I don't know, but I would guess that this happened beforehand as part of the building up to that process uh, would be my guess. Uh, yeah, Ajahn. Yes. Uh, may I know why but is the Buddha's knowledge about the deities important in his awakening? Ah, sorry, say, can you say again, please? Why is the Buddha's knowledge about the deities uh, important in his awakening? It's just that the paragraph say he he uh, meditate on it and try to find what are the deities, who are they, yeah. and then he has conversation with them. Yeah, it is important because uh, uh, remember that what the Buddha is trying to find out uh, is. Uh, how to find happiness in the world, yeah? That's the Buddha's search. He knows that life is suffering. This is what he found out as a lay person. He, there's death, there's old age, there's all of these problems in life. What is the solution? Now, to be able to find the solution, you have to understand what is possible in the world. What are the possible rebirths? How do you get reborn there? Is it possible to stay as a deva forever, for example? Remember, the existing religion at the time in India was Brahmanism. And according to Brahmanism, when you die, the self goes to Brahma, and Brahma and the self become one, and it goes on like, like that forever. So then the Buddha wants to find out, is there such a thing? Yeah? Is it possible to have an eternal state afterwards, uh, where you are with God, where you are with Brahma, like Christianity says as well, right? you go and hang out with God. And it sounds nice if it happens forever, but what if you die? 
and you come back again, you get reborn as an animal, then it's a problem, right? So this is what the Buddha is figuring out here. He's trying to understand what is possible in the universe. And by having a full understanding of su happiness and suffering, yeah, then only does again the insight, what needs to be required. And it can give everything up, and it can go beyond that. And this is what the Four, the, the, uh, the four Noble Truths are about. They're giving up craving for any kind of rebirth, because all the rebirth is problematic, and making an end of everything. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Ajahn, can yes. I ask please? Please. Yeah. Um, back to the, f the question which I asked just now, I interrupted you. Sorry yeah, about no, that's, that. that. No worries at all, yeah, please. <laughs> How did yeah. he get into that state of, you mentioned his meditation, because my, under my shallow understanding is when we meditate, we don't do anything. Yeah. But he's doing a lot of things here. He's even engaging in mental conversations. Yeah. So I cannot. So is, I, it, I, is he in the jhana? Yeah. Is he no. a beginning yeah. of the meditation or beyond jhana? This happens. I'm, I, I, he, I'm confused. I, I, think he, I, I don't think he is in meditation really when this happens, but he has just prepared his mind through meditation. So the mind is, uh, is powerful and stilled and able to focus easily. Huh? Yeah. So it's very often these things will happen uh, in meditation. You might see some of these things happening before jhana, yeah, when the mind is becoming very peaceful, uh, and suddenly start to see things happening. Uh, like you have this vision of forms that yeah, we talked about here the other day. These visions happen when the mind becomes powerful and peaceful. That's where you can access these deities. Uh, and then because of that stillness of the mind, you can then use it to have conversations and all of these kind of things. Uh, but it's not in jhana, it's just that you have made the mind ready, so the mind has the ability to focus properly and to stay with things. So it's like when you come out of a meditation, if you want to read something after a good meditation, you can focus easily on what you're reading. Yeah? Similar kind of thing, yeah, because you are uh, not, not really in meditation anymore, but you're using the power of meditation to, to help you. Huh? Yeah. Venerable. <laughs> I just want to share <coughs> about you know talking in a deep state of <laughs> meditation. Yeah. At one time, I think about twenty years, almost twenty years ago, I was meditating actually at Nila Bay. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And then in my deep you know state of meditation, I saw a man uh, in white with a white turban. You know, like Indian. Man, mm. you know, till this day they still have that turban. And I, uh, I, in my deep state of meditation, I asked him, well, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> so the, what I'm saying is that, you know, in the deep state of meditation, mm. you can also communicate. Right, yeah, exactly. Can, yeah. you know, yeah. think. And I don't know it was the deva or what. I don't. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. And it's like what a question. It and it's, like, it's like a question. It doesn't really have any. It doesn't mean in Thai or English. It's just a question which is general, right? It kind of goes with any, any language. I think so. you were speaking in English. You speak in English, were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I asked him, "Well, who are you?" Yeah, okay. You know, in in uh, my English. Okay. <laughs> but he didn't reply. Uh huh. He didn't reply. He didn't understand English. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can take a few more questions because it's an interesting topic. So we have <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Yeah. Yeah. It's indeed an interesting question. Uh, yeah. As you travel around Asia, you probably already know that. There are a lot of ghosts in Asia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we can, yeah. we, we can relate to that. I think we, we come to believe in ghosts because I think we either know somebody who saw ghosts or who knows somebody who saw ghosts. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I think we can relate to that. And uh, also, we, as my personal experience, I heard that even our late chief from uh, Mahavihara. As a personal experience, I think with that, and he relate to that story. Yeah. So it's quite easy to believe ghosts exist. Yeah. But as far as devas concerned, I'm not sure whether anybody see devas or before and how does it look like. Yeah. At least one point. Another point is uh, you mentioned it. I think 
around the world, there are a lot of people who believe in gods only because of the inner feeling or that. But there's a lot of story that those gods are created because of the gap of knowledge. The, the, the gap, gap of knowledge. Gap of knowledge. Yeah, because I think in the past people don't understand thunder. Yeah. So they created those gods. Yeah, the gods of god of the gaps. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, yeah. as those get narrow, yeah. those gods disappear. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, yeah. I'm not sure whether this, those devas are because of that gap of knowledge or they already exist. Or could it be another possible explanation? They're actually aliens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I do, I, yes, I, I think, uh, I, you know, I mean, from a Buddhist point of view, these gods, they are, they, they don't necessarily have any, um, any work to do, like creating thunder or creating the wind or making the crops ripen and all those kind of things. This is kind of the ancient ideas from the old days that the gods had a lot of uh, power in that sense. And that is not really mentioned in the suttas in the, in the same way. They are there, but they are just a happy rebirth, and it's not really, don't necessarily have much impact on the world as such. Uh, so I would say that that's true, and I think that was kind of the way things, people looked at gods in, in those days, and perhaps the gods could intervene sometimes, but I think the fact that they believed in gods, uh, and then how they understood those gods to be in, involved in the world, maybe two slightly different things. They, I'm not saying that everything they thought about the gods was right necessarily, uh, but the idea of God seemed to have been right. Uh, now, the extent to which they interfered in the world, that may be subject to debate. Uh, but I think the idea is roughly, roughly right. Uh, and I think maybe that may be a kind of a tapping into a certain reality that, uh, you know, sometimes you can have these visions. Yes, it is more common to have vision of ghosts, it's true. Uh, but I think the idea of gods and the idea of ghosts is a very similar kind of idea. Because once you have a sense that other beings are possible, beings that are created by mind, uh, then that opens up all kinds of beings, uh, unhappy beings, happy beings, and all kinds of things. I think they are basically the, it's basically the same idea that is used. Uh, so uh, I, you know, I, I think that these are very, uh, personally I have no problem with these things. And the last point you're making about uh, having, you know, being aliens, uh, I think that's a very interesting point. Why is it that we sometimes people see things in the world? Uh, yeah, and there are it's a lot of uh, been a lot of confirmation recently by uh, the American, uh, you know, Air Force and military service having all these classified documents about seeing all kind of UFOs and all of these kind of things. Or I think these are called unidentified aerial phenomena, or something like that. I'm sure. But uh, and so, what are these things if they are? They seem to be true. Something seems to be happening. What are they? And I think one explanation is that they are devas, right? Uh, there's something out there that's going on. Uh, are we really, are UFOs coming from a different solar system? Uh, I don't know. Uh, to me, that seems very fanciful. But that they are devas, to me, seems a much more realistic possibility uh, than the fact that they have come from some kind of other solar system. So that is, an, that is a very interesting hypothesis. Uh, and I, uh, you know, because something is obviously happening in the world. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> I think they see Ma air balloons. <laughs> air, air balloons and other thing, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so uh, anyway, but I think that there's many things. The world is a complex place, and many things happening. I think we are kind of getting in, maybe a little bit far into speculation now, but uh, <laughs> it's still fascinating. Yeah. Any further yeah. questions? Here we have one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Suki uh, Hotu Ajahn. This is a curious question mm. referring to I found out whether or not I have previously lived together with those deities. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there are 31 realms. Yeah. So did the Buddha go to most of the realms or uh, just the deities realms? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know if he has been to all. Some of them are very hard to access, I think, because they are so uh, refined and... Uh, you know, like the realms that have are the corresponding corresponding to the immaterial realms and these kind of things. They last for eighty four thousand eons, according to the sutta. As one of those realms, I don't know if you can converse with those deities because they are so deeply in samadhi that they probably is no way to get access to them. They probably are locked into that state. So, uh, but generally speaking, it looks like the Buddha did a you know or Buddha to be. He really found out as much as he needed to find out to understand how the universe works. Uh, that seems to be kind of the main issue here. Uh, 
and whether he actually needed to go to every realm, I, I don't know whether that really was required or not. Uh, so, uh, you know, another thing, 31 realms of existence, that is that a law of the world that is always 31 realms? Or is it sometimes less than 31 and sometimes more than 31 realms? Uh, I don't think we should take those numbers as absolute either because everything is always changing here. Everything is always morphing into something else. Uh, so there are these possibilities of happiness and suffering, but they may take different shapes and different forms. Uh, you know, wh when there was no human beings on Earth uh, a few million years ago, uh, so what happened to the human realm then? Uh, so maybe there was no human realm at that time. Maybe it was either your animal or you're a god, but no human realm existed yet. Uh, Yes, that, that kind of thing yeah, is, uh, kind of makes it interesting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, I don't really have the full answer to that, but uh, I don't know if it's necessary to be, go to every one of these realms. Yeah. Um, just, um, uh, I don't, just to, uh, I'm a bit confused because sometimes when we talk about time, uh, especially near death experiences, uh, time doesn't exist. Um, it's all in the present moment. But when we talk about the devas here, there is, seems to be like there's a time yeah. dimension to that. So I'm a bit confused. Huh? Um, well, uh, t time is really just a measure of change, right? Uh, so when there is change, there is time, and it's kind of it's kind of they go together. So it's true that we are we only exist in the present moment, but we also notice change, uh, and that kind of change is really what we I think mean when we talk about time. Uh, so uh, so you can see that these devas they will they will be changed, right? They will die. D dying is kind of one of the most important aspects of change, and this is why impermanence is so uh, unpleasant because there is death, uh, even though you live in the present moment. Uh, Death happens in the present, uh, and you, you go through those processes. Uh, so those gods will live in time, in the sense that they will have a lifespan. They will only last for so long, uh, when we use, think of time in a, in a normal way. Uh, and that is very different from the idea of a creator god. A creator god lives outside of time. Uh, and uh, anything which lives outside of time is something that, by, by definition, you can never experience, because all experiences are in time. So let's say that you are someone who believes in a creator god. Yeah? There are so many religions who believe in that. Say, say you're a Hindu and you believe in the Brahma created the universe. Uh, and then you ask them, well, how do you know that? And they will say, well, I had an experience. I met Brahma. Yeah? I had an experience with Brahma. Uh, uh, and then you ask them about that experience. Well, wh why do you think that experience is Brahma? And they will tell you, well, it was because it was blissful, uh, because there was no sense of self there. Uh, because there was a sense of uni unity, I was unified with the whole world. Uh, that's why I think it was Brahma. Uh. But then you ask them, well, but how do you know that this is eternal? Uh? And there is no, uh, they can't know that, uh, because that experience you had is short, it only lasts for a short period of time. If you say that there is an eternal component to this, uh, that is speculation. It always has to be speculation. You can never know eternity. Uh. You can never know something outside of time. Uh. So uh, whenever anyone who claims to have a, an idea of a creator God, uh, it is always going to be in part speculation, because it's not an experience that you can have. That's what I mean, that this is created by mind. Uh, everything outside of time must be a creation by mind, a creation by human beings. Uh, and so to me it is the other way around, because normally if you discuss with someone who believes in a creator God, uh, or you know, a modern human being, they will argue that our gods are mental creations. Yeah, these gods in the suttas are created by us, uh, whereas the real god is the creator god. Uh, but I argue it's actually the opposite the other way around, uh, because it is the creator god that can never be experienced. It's the creator god which is beyond the possibility of human experience, whereas these gods here, they are just like us. And because they are just like us, just like I can experience you, yeah, and everyone here, these gods are also, at least in principle, experienceable through meditation and these kind of things. Uh, so um, that is my argument. And I, uh, sometimes I have passed it by, by philosophers to make sure that my argument is good enough. Uh, and uh, it, se it seems like uh, it is uh, generally a, you know, a, a, a good argument. Uh, uh, and, and it's hard to really refute that argument, to be honest. Uh. Um, Ajahn, just, uh, it's fascinating how the, uh, the Buddha just uh, speaks about this 
deities in such ordinary terms, mm. uh, our common understanding is the gods are divine. <laughs> yep. uh, that's our Western influence, and also uh, Chinese don't have that. that uh, Chinese Chinese see the gods as uh, people we can bribe and and get 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 favors, <laughs> and you know that's that's that's. That. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, but, that's, uh, right. that's uh, exactly but, uh, what it's uh, like. <laughs> 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 we, we, we we always have this uh, bringing up that uh, we we see them as uh, divine beings. Yeah. And the word divine seems to indicate that they are uh, high order, that they they can uh, they are more powerful, and that that's also what we have been told in the movies. And it's fascinating that the Buddha just treats that experience as a very kind of ordinary, yeah. which goes very counter. Counterintuitive to to a lot of people, including ordinary peers persons. Absolutely, yeah. and this seems a little bit anti-establishment to me, like, you know? So, so my question is, was the Buddha the the, the first anti-establishment? Uh, yeah. You know, to say, you know, hang on, the gods are not so special yeah. after all. The, the, the Buddha was a black sheep, you know. <laughs> I, <laughs> he really was. He went against everything. Yeah, he went against the uh, the, the temple society. He, Kind of abandoned the caste system in the uh, in, in the sangha. He uh, reassigned the gods to a very low place in the universe. Yeah, the Buddha is on top. Yeah, the Buddha is the one with wisdom. The Buddha is the one with uh, there's a, there's a nice sutta. The uh, sak- you know the Sakapanya sutta, the questions of Sakka in the Diga Nikaya 21. Huh? And uh, Sakka comes down to the Buddha. First of all, Sakka, which is very kind of cute, Sakka is shy when he wants to visit the Buddha. So because Sakka is shy, he says to Panchasika, Panchasika the Gandhava, that, okay, you go down, you get the attention of the Buddha. And once you have the attention, then I will come down because I'm, a, I'm a feeling a bit shy in the presence of the Buddha. This is the Lord of the gods, right? Like you say, divine is really high up, but he's shy when it comes to the Buddha. So he sends Panchasika down, and Panchasika, which is also very curious, uh, he goes down, and the way that he gets the attention of the Buddha is by singing a love song. <laughs> it's really extraordinary. And he says things like, oh, just like I love this young girl, this, this maiden, oh, just in the same way as I love this young maiden, in the same way the Arahants love the Dhamma. <laughs> it's really, it's very, it's very curious. And, it is so curious that you wonder what maybe it actually did happen because people are strange. Yeah, I mean, a, a god, the Gandhava, he doesn't understand anything about the Dhamma, he doesn't understand what's going on. Uh, and it's not something that someone would invent because it just seems so, it seems so blasphemic almost, right? I mean, with the Buddha to do something like that. So I wonder whether something similar may actually have happened because it's so outrageous in many ways. Uh, and anyway, so then he, he, uh, he gets the attention of the Buddha, and then once he's got the attention and he says to Saka, oh Saka, the Buddha is ready, you know, please come down, yeah, the, the Buddha is ready to see you or whatever. So he comes down, and then Saka asks the Buddha, can I ask you some questions? And then the Buddha says to him, well, you know, can I ask you first whether you have asked these questions of anyone else before? And then the Saka says, yeah, oh yeah, I went to the Niganta Nataputta, and I went to the Makkaligosala, and I went to many of these famous teachers in the day. And when I went to them and I asked these questions, uh, and uh, what was the first question that he asks again? Uh, uh, I can't remember what exactly the first question was, but uh, uh, when I did that, uh, instead of kind of me becoming their disciples because they could teach me the Dhamma, because I am so glo- he's a God, right? Very glorious. Uh, they fell to their knees and bowed down to me and became my disciples instead. Uh, so here is Sakka wanting to find out the answers, but all of these people, instead of actually giving him the answer, they became his disciples, started bowing down to him. Because when you see a god like that, you can imagine that what you see is something very powerful. You see this powerful light, this powerful presence. And most people would think that they have discovered God, right? This must be God. And they would actually bow down and they would kind of be overwhelmed by the power of the situation. You can very easily imagine that. But the Buddha, because he knows what is going on, he is, not, uh, he is not blinded by that kind of display of power and light. Uh, so the Buddha is one of the few people who actually says, okay, yeah, you may be a god, doesn't mean you have much insight. Uh, yeah? You have your place in the hierarchy, but sorry, I'm wiser than you are, uh, because I have seen the full uh, scope of things. Uh, yeah? 
And so uh, this is kind of what is going on there. So even though something is divine, I think what we are often blinded by, we are blinded by power, we are blinded by light, we are blinded by the display of something very grand. It's a bit like in the human realm. If you see someone who is very powerful in the human realm, very wealthy, who has everything, we are blinded by that as well. Huh? Yeah? We stop to think of them as ordinary human beings, even though they are completely ordinary here. Huh? If you know wealthy people, and as a monk I happen to know a few wealthy people, they're completely ordinary here, just like you and me here. But somehow we are blinded by this display of wealth and power, and we think they are special. They are not special. And uh, so this is exactly the same thing with the kind of godly realm. And this is why I think often we go wrong with these kind of things, uh, and we get the wrong end of the stick, uh, and we forget that the Buddha is actually the one with the insight. Uh. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but anyway, just, uh, yeah. Please, uh, yeah. Thank you. Ajahn, morning. Uh, just one question. In the Deva realm, are there also followers of Buddha? They, yes, they are. Uh, yeah, so they are disciples of the Buddha because they, uh, the Buddha is said to be teachers of gods and humans. Uh, and according to the Sakapanya Sutta, Saka came down to the Buddha, asked him some very it's actually a very beautiful sutta, uh, and it goes to in a very, very deeply about the causes of conflict and the cause of problems in the world. And at the, according to the sutta, at the end of the sutta, Saka becomes a stream enter uh, because he understands what's going on. Then he is a real Buddhist. Uh, so, in the Devaloka, in the heavenly realm, they are ruled by a stream enter. Uh, that's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So that's would be, so if you get reborn in that Devaloka, if you kind of play your cards right as they say in this life, you get reborn there. Your next boss, your next, maybe your boss in this life is a really bad boss, this will be a really good one. Yeah, they have the, <laughs> they're the best kind of boss in the heavenly realm. Man. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions about this uh, interesting topic of devas? Everyone okay here? Probably, yeah. Yeah, Ajahn. The, uh, as we go higher up the Deva realms to Brahma, yeah. the lifespan is, gets longer and longer. Yeah, yeah. So does the converse goes through when we go lower, lower realms, the lifespan gets shorter and shorter? I don't know. It, it doesn't. I don't think it does, actually. I think the, the shortest is actually in the, uh, maybe the animal realm is the shortest one. Yeah. And the lifespan can be very short, like one day or a few hours, you know, if you come to insects and that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but I think uh, a lot of the lower realms, like the uh, Peta Loka, the ghost realm, uh, and also the hell realm, depends on the Kama, how long they last. And you can stay in those realms for a long time uh, if you actually, uh, you know, if you made some bad Kama. Uh, and I think the, the reason why the human realm, uh, maybe the human realm is the shortest one. Bec and the reason that is the case, because the human realm is supposed to be the outcome of a good Kama. Yeah, and then the kama becomes better and better as you go up. That's why the lifespan always goes longer, because the better and better kama. But once you go below the human realm, it's the outcome of bad kama. So that changes the equation. Huh? And that's why the human realm is usually the shortest one, because it's the lowest kind of good kama. Below that, uh, it's uh, bad kama. So maybe below that, it becomes longer and longer as the bad kama becomes worse. Yeah? And then the hell realm, boy, you stay there for, I hope, it's scary, isn't it? Staying there for a long time. I don't, don't want to do that. Uh, make sure you live well in this, <laughs> in this life. Uh, it's interesting that in the, uh, the lower realms, uh, the, um, the uh, lowest realm is obviously the hell realm, but the second lowest is the animal realm. Uh, and then comes the ghost realm, and then comes the human realm. Yeah? We often think that the ghosts are below the animals, but actually the animals are below the ghosts, uh, according to the suttas. Uh, so ghosts is uh, unpleasant, but maybe not so... Not super duper unpleasant, yeah. It's kind of uh, you don't, just don't have enough food. You are a bit hungry all the time. That sounds got bad enough already. But uh, um, yeah, so uh, uh, Ajahn, I thought the hell realm is the shortest because they experience death and rebirth uh, many times a day. Isn't that the case? I, 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 it's, what is it? I think the normal way that this is explained in the suttas is even though you kind of have your uh, limbs chopped off, and even though you get stakes, you know, stakes kind of put through the middle of your heart, and these kind of things, you don't actually die because your karma hasn't been used up. Uh, 
So you are experiencing things that would normally make you die in the human realm, but in the hell realm you don't die because your karma hasn't been used up yet. Uh, so I think that's kind of what's going on there. You, the incredible suffering, but you, the body kind of somehow carries on because of the karma hasn't been exhausted. That's my understanding how it is described in the suttas. Uh, you don't die. I think it specifically says you don't die until that karma has been used up uh, or something like that. Uh. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. Interesting topic, right? Devas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm oh, talking to the devas, right, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of lot of that, yeah. Yeah, see, she, she was just saying that Ajahn Man was always talking to the devas in, the, in his book, in his biography, or whatever. Yeah, so that's true. All right, so um, we are getting quite close to 11. I, if there are any more comments or questions, we can carry on a few more minutes. Then we're gonna, apparently we're going to have a group picture according to the boss at the back there, according to Bobby. So, but I'm happy to take another question or two if you if you wish is any anyone else like to say anything okay we have one over here yeah namaste ajan thank you for the fun and interesting suttas <laughs> um regarding what you spoke about karma earlier yeah. uh, i think more in reference to vipaka karma yeah. about um pleasure and pain and the normal misconception of how we understand karma mm. Uh, like you said, it's not about being uh, ha marrying someone. Yeah, could you explain more about how, how, what is the right understanding of yeah. karma and and vipaka karma and the relationship? Yeah. Thank okay. You. So um, the karma is a very, um, it's often a very misunderstood uh, subject, and a lot of people don't really kind of grasp it properly. Yeah. And uh, a lot of uh, things are are really. Um, you know, th things like, for example, being reborn as a woman is a result of bad karma. It's kind of one of those misunderstandings. But actually, whether you're a woman or a man, your life is very similar in many ways. Uh, okay, true. It is, I would say that on average, it probably is a little bit more difficult to be a woman in the world than to be a man. It's true on average, but the difference is small. Much more difficult to be a mosquito, right? Uh, that, that's, that's where the big differences are found, uh, whereas the difference between man and woman isn't that great. Uh, so I think that is a misunderstanding. The reason why you get reborn as a woman or a man is usually because of habit. Yeah, you, you are used to being a woman, so you'd like to be a woman in the future. You're used to being a man, so you'd like to be a man in the future. It's kind of we are just used to that position in our society, and so it carries on in that sense. So I think that is the main reason why you get reborn. That's what I mean, the difference between habit and kamma. Yeah, one is a habit, one is a kamma. And uh, the same thing if you choose in this life to kind of have a you know, you, you come into this world with a certain habits from the past, certain things that you like, certain kind of foods that you like. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, you don't eat that food because of kamma, you eat it because of habit that you have made up in the past. Uh, why you choose certain profession, uh, most of the things in life are habits from the past. Uh. So kamma is how we experience the world. Uh. So you uh, live your life in a certain way, and if you do intentionally many bad things, uh, then the result of that will be that you will feel bad feelings. Uh, and you know that that is true, because um, if you look at your present life right now, if you do something bad against another person, how do you feel about yourself afterwards? You usually feel bad, right? Uh, yeah, afterwards you regret, you have remorse for that, and you feel bad about yourself. So we can know from this life uh, that bad intentions have bad results. Uh, and if you do something truly kind, you actually feel good about yourself afterwards. Uh, good intentions usually lead to good feelings. Uh, and this, this is a general law that not only is applicable in this life right here now, but it goes across lifetimes. In other words, you, it's like those bad things that you did in the past, they leave an imprint in your mind uh, so that you bring that regret and that remorse with you into the future. Uh, and then you feel bad and you have bad consequences in future lives. Uh, and then when you are the, on the edge of being reborn, because you have regret and you have remorse, uh, you send yourself to a bad destination. Uh, if you feel good about yourself, you send yourself to a good destination. Yeah? 
So this is kind of how the um, the kamma really works. It's kind of a, once you start to think about it in that way, it starts to seem very natural and very ordinary principles at work. So uh, that is uh, how to think about kamma. Many many things that happen to 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 us as well. This is another aspect of kamma which I think is often misunderstood. A lot of the things that happen in your life, even painful things, are not necessarily about kamma. Everything isn't kamma. So it specifically says in the suttas, for example, that you can uh, have illnesses, uh, and illnesses are just part of the human condition. Yeah, human beings, we have bodies that get sick, yeah? and because you have a body that gets sick, if you are reborn as a human being, sickness is guaranteed. Uh, got nothing to do with kamma or a specific thing you did in the past. It's simply because you are human. Uh, if you are human, uh, you are sometimes going to do things. You are going to be careless sometimes. Uh, when you are careless. Accidents can happen. Uh, it's not because of karma; it's because you're careless, uh, right? Uh, and the, the suttas even talk about assault. You get assaulted because you go. Uh, is KL is that a dangerous place? Uh, no, not not dangerous. Okay, okay, okay. So, what is a dangerous place? A dan really dangerous city in the world? Maybe s KL, KL, <laughs> New York. I, I I was just in New York recently. New York was okay actually. New York was not, not a big problem. I was I was really surprised. Colorado, <laughs> Johannesburg, okay, that's true. South Africa is quite scary, that's true actually. So if you go into the wrong place in Johannesburg in the middle of the night with lots of money all over, play, right? Everyone can see you're really wealthy. Then you're being careless, you're asking for trouble and you're going to get assaulted, right? So, so the, all of these things, uh, and this is just because you are human, you can expect certain things. You can expect to break a leg. You can expect to get a divorce. You can expect to lose your job. You can also expect a nice meal at a nice restaurant, like the BGF restaurant down the bottom. Yeah, really nice restaurant here. Or you, so all of these things are part of the common human experience, and they should not be understood as, come as a result of particular actions in the past. Uh, so lots of, lots of misunderstandings about karma. So uh, when you see another person in a bad situation, for example, maybe they are handicapped or something like that, uh, never think it is your fault. You did bad actions in the past. That's the wrong way of thinking about karma. If someone has been reborn in a bad way, always have compassion because it can happen to every one of us. Uh, don't kind of become cold-hearted and callous and uncaring, which actually happens in Buddhist circles, because we see oh, that's their fault, they are, they are to blame, so no need to care for them. Uh, that's completely the wrong way of thinking about things. Uh, yeah. Okay, one more question over here. Bobby, whenever you think it's time to do the photo, just let us know, so we make sure we have enough time. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning, yeah. Uh, I've heard this from a monk uh, before. Good monk or bad monk? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. He said that uh, women cannot become a Buddha. Is that true? <laughs> okay, this is not another one of those controversial questions, yeah? <laughs> I have to be careful what I say, is that what you mean? Uh, okay. <laughs> So um, the answer to that question is that if you look at the uh, suttas, if you look at the word of the Buddha, there's a sutta called the Bahudhataka Sutta, the many kind of elements. Uh, and in that sutta, it actually says in the Pali that it's impossible for a woman to become a Buddha. That's what it says in that sutta. So is, did the Buddha actually say that, or is this kind of dodgy, or how do we not know? Uh, now there was an interesting study done by Venerable Analoyo, and he compares that sutta to other suttas in, uh, translated into Chinese and other languages. Uh, and he came to the conclusion that this was a later addition to that sutta, not original. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think that's quite, pos quite likely to be correct. Uh, and uh, it's important to remember that, uh, again, you know, Indian society two and a half thousand years ago was a very male-dominated society. Uh, and in that society, it probably seemed inconceivable that a woman should become a Buddha because they, you know, they didn't have the power or that sort of thing to really look, look like they could become a Buddha. Uh, so sometimes the, the prevailing culture at the time influences the text in certain ways. Uh, and uh, this may have been part, some of that influence because there's always no text is completely stable. Uh, there's always going to be things that get added to these things over time 
commentary may make its way into the original text, these sort of things. There's various kind of ways and this, uh, this happens. Uh, and uh, so I would say that, uh, to me, there is no solid evidence that that is true. Uh, uh, can a woman become a Buddha? I say, why not? Uh, What was that? <laughs> Safe. No, but I think that I think that the uh, the argument is based on a certain uh, certain reality. It's not just kind of my. I'm not just kind of chickening out because of all, all the uh, because of all the women in the audience. I think it's based on a certain truth. I try to be honest. I don't try not to be kind of uh, dishonest. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, and so it, yeah. That's what it, that's what it means. But specifically, Samasambuddha. That's the that's, that was the point here. Yeah. A couple of more questions. One at the at the back yeah, there. Yeah. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on the human being possessed by spirits. Say again. Sorry. Sorry. The a, a human being being possessed by spirits. You know, where possessed by spirits. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, how is it happen, or in the Buddhist perspective, can we prevent that actually? Can you prevent it? Uh, they say that the way to prevent it is by living well, by li being virtuous. So if you are a good person, if you are a good character, then the spirit cannot get, gain access apparently. Uh, so if you live a bad life and you don't live well, then it's easier for the spirit to get access to you. But if you are a good person, then it is not going to happen, apparently. Uh, that is the way to stop it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Ajahn, uh, one last question. Since we're on the topic of uh, male and female just now, yeah. so in, in the higher realm, in the Deva realm, yeah. do they also have uh, both gender? Do they have both gender in the... Deva realms, they do up to a point. So uh, there is a, once you go to the Deva Lokas that, that, that are equivalent of deep samadhi, gender disappears. Uh, gender doesn't have its, have its place anymore. So once you go to the very high Deva realm, there's no gender. Uh, it's just beings. Uh, and that is a bit like when you meditate. Yeah? If you go deep into meditation practice, uh, then there comes a point when you lose your sense of your gender. You don't feel like a man or a woman anymore. You are just the mind, the bright mind. That bright mind doesn't have a gender. And then you're just beings, so just pure loving kindness. And it's that for, for everyone. So that's kind of the beauty of this. Is that, and this is, I think, in one way you can argue that the Buddha doesn't really have a gender. Phys physically, yes, but not mentally. Mentally gone beyond gender. So Buddha is uh, mentally is neither really a man or a woman. Uh, in fact, the Buddha doesn't really have any identity at all. He's neither Indian, nor a man, nor a woman, nor anything. Uh, gone beyond all of those kind of identities. Uh, so the Buddha becomes like this uh, universe. And that's why the Buddha can become a teacher for everyone, precisely because it has gone beyond the sense of identity. Uh, so what we are looking at when we're seeing the Buddha, what we're seeing is really Dhamma qualities. Uh, what we see is kindness. What we see is compassion, understanding. We're not really seeing a human being in an ordinary sense. Uh, All right, so uh, Bobby, you are il bosso, so you, you have to decide. Shall we, is now the time to have a group picture or? Uh? We can do it, we can, yeah, we can do it now. Uh, now might be a good time, everyone is still here, yeah, yeah.